So, without further ado, we need to get started. Sure. And first up, to wow you and entertain you all the way from Alain is Jose Awesome. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. We need the lights off, if possible, upstairs. All right, so I work in uh, UA University in robotics, and so I'm going to talk about the future of robotics. Anybody interested here in robotics? Awesome. So let's go. Let's go. Um, so I'm going to tell some facts about robotics, right? Um, this is the typical industrial robot that you can find in an assembly line. Excellent. And um, there are about one million such robots in the world. Most of them are in Japan. That's where I studied robotics. And um, another 30% is in Europe, mostly in Germany. And there are not so many in the US. And a country that is growing a lot in robot population is China. Um, if you count the industrial robots, which, which are the, yeah, the ones you can find in factories, and you add up the ones that are not in factories, the ones that are in your home or in the hospitals, like the Da Vinci operating system for surgery, you end up with a number which is 20 million robots today. And here there's a graph with the years and the number of robots. And right now we're about 20 million. So anybody notice something here? This is a typical exponential curve, yes? So the interesting thing about this is that we don't know where it will end. Um, are we going to stabilize the robot population about 40 million? or it's going to be more, or it's just started, yes? So whenever you're in a curve, which is exponential, it means you are in a very interesting uh, time to be. Um, now I'm going to talk about the, the fashion in robotics, like the trends, and what was fashionable before. So during the 70s to the 90s, the keyword, the case application for robotics was the so-called three Ds, which are dirty, dull, and dangerous, right? So the best application for robotics during these years was welding robot, because humans are not so very good at welding, and it's a very dangerous and dirty job. Uh, then during the Cold War, you also had these um, missiles, the intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, and of course, the auto industry was um, a big uh, pusher for robotics. Yeah? So these were the three main drivers of robotics during these years. In the 20s, it was about emotional robots. So it was more about Paro. I don't know if you know this one. This is Paro. is a robot developed in Japan. It cost about 3000 plus plus dollars. And this is the energy feeding into the robot. And this robot is in deployed in hospitals for elderly care. So it's like a pet. So the old people just take care of it and they, the health improves. They take like less medicine. So this was a very good case study, very successful in Japan. Um, another robot that was famous during the 2000s was Eyeball, developed by Sony. Uh, Sony didn't make any money with this robot. It was this little dog. Um, they stopped production. But it was about entertaining the, the human. And another trend that became popular in the 2000s was the sports robotics. So during the 2000s, you start seeing a lot of robot competitions, like the RoboCup and the DARPA challenge became quite famous. Yeah? So it, it was more about the uh, emotion of the user. And now, where are we? We are in the robotics, which are AI-driven. It's like um, this year has been very interesting because it's the first year where a robot can drive a car better than a human. And it's also the year, this year, in which a robot can see better than a human. It's the first time 
that the robot can identify objects with more accuracy than humans. And if you look at the robotics competition, you see DARPA has, has been a, a, a good pusher of the self-driving cars. And then you have the RoboCup, and they have the objective of assembling a team of robots that can beat the human team by 2020. And if you go online and you look at the videos of the RoboCup, you will see that some of the robots are quite good at playing soccer. I mean, they would beat us quite easily. OK, so that's, that's the paradigms, like how the trends change it. Dirty, like industrial things, more emotional, and now it's totally AI driven. Um, so where are we, right? So if you look at other revolutions that happened before, um, like the computer revolution. Um, so you see it starts usually with military applications. And then 10 years later, it moves to corporate applications. So when the computer started, it was about military, calculating the trajectory of a missile. Then IBM uh, developed the IBM 360, which was great. And then 10 years later, about 10 years later, independent companies start developing robots for hobbyists. This was one of the first such computers, not robots. Uh, this was the Altair, 8800. And shortly after that, 10 years later, you got the Mac. And that's when computers enter the home. So if you look at this, you see like a trend, military, corporate, hobbies start doing something, and then some company figures out how to mass market it. In robotics, we, we have military applications, we have done the industrial applications, and right now, people like Bill Gates, they say, hey, wait a minute, I've seen this happen before. And they take a look, and if you go to Japan, you go to Akihabara, this electric city, you will see lots of adults and young people, and they go there, and they gather, and they are building their own robots. Not just assembling kits from the store, they are building their own robots. So people like Bill Gates say, oh, I've seen this before. It's not going to be long until we see robots at home. Right? If you look at other revolutions like the automobile, this is the famous Model T. Um, so if you take a look at what was happening before the Model T came, became popular, um, there were lots of automobile companies, but all of them were catering to the luxury market. There were about 500 automobile companies making luxury automobiles. And then one day, Ford comes out with this Model T, which was much, much cheaper than the rest of the models. And it, it's, it's when it became popular, right? So if you look at robots today, um, you probably know this one called Asimo by Honda, right? So you can ask yourself, is this going to be the next 4T that's going to popularize robotics? And you can say no, because it costs more than $1 million, right? So you can start seeing, like, there's going to be a lot of robots that are not going to make it. Like, I was one of them, and Asimo is too expensive. So, so some companies got this right. Um, do you know this robot? Who knows this one? Yes, what's the name? So, so, yes. So this is called the iRobot, iRumba. This is one of the first robots that became popular. It just cleans your floor independently at home. Yeah? They sold 10 million units of this. Yeah? When they start selling this robot, people say, yeah, I got a robot that cleans the floor. But today, if you ask the same people, they say, yeah, I got a vacuum cleaner. Yeah? So this is an example of people who got it right. Cost is important. You cannot sell expensive things. Who else got it right? Do you know this robot? Do you know this company? So this company called SoftBank um, is a telecom operator in Japan. 
the owner of SoftBank is called the Bill Gates of Japan, and he now wants to popularize robots, and he's making this robot called Pepper. He wants to sell it for $3,000, and he says it's a robot that makes your heart happy. Yes? So, do you know this robot? This robot is called Baxter, it's developed in Boston, Massachusetts, and it's one of the first robots that has common sense. So the blue collar worker can come here and move the Baxter's arms and train him to pick up an object and put it in a box. And then Baxter, when he sees the next object coming, he knows I have to pick up this thing and put it in a box. Yeah? So they say it's the first robot that is competitive with Chinese labor costs, which is about $4 an hour. Yes? They say that this robot will bring manufacturing back to the USA. Yes? I tried this robot. It doesn't work as advertised. OK, so what's next? Another very good case for robotics is self-driving cars, right? Uh, Google says that this year they're going to launch it in the California. Um, also, if you look at the press, you can see that there's a competition for buying robotics companies. So two years ago, Google bought uh, eight robotics companies yeah, at once. And that's very, well, that's very interesting. Um, so I think the future of robot is going to be like this. Do you know this one? Maybe old people know here. <laughs> <laughs> what is this one? It's the cartoon. It's Jetsons. The Jetsons, right, right. And this character is called Roxy, and he was the cleaning maid, right? So OK, many people think or agree that that's going to be the killer application for robotics. Um, but how is that going to happen? Um, so one thing from my point of view in the university, what I see developing software apps and robotics is that it's going to be like Windows and the PC. Whoever makes an operating system for robots is going to have a head start. Yeah? So the OS matters. And Google has one OS called Android. And it's not a coincidence that the Android logo is a robot. The other thing I think will happen is that in the future, families will not buy cars. The big ticket expense of the family for the year is not going to be a car. It's going to be a robot. And the robot is not going to be very expensive. It's going to cost $10,000, $20,000, like a car. But the apps are going to be expensive. And what kind of apps? You're going to download apps like teach English to my kids, or babysit my kids, or take my dog for a walk, or uh, wash my dishes, et cetera, et cetera. So to do all these, you need one thing. It's not about the hardware anymore. It's about the AI. Yes, you need lots and lots of computing power. So these are the three things, I think, that going to shape the future of home robotics. Right? So OK, we know that's what's coming. So how to profit of it? Right? So one thing I can tell you is like, when the car came, like, the thing to do was not buying car companies. Like, when the car revolution started in US, there were 500 car companies. Now you have two and a half car companies, right? Uh, if you had invested in one of those car companies, you probably would not get the money back, right? So same with robotics. Do not invest in robotic companies. It's going to be a bloodbath, and there's going to be few winners. Um, one thing you can do is do apps for robots, right? And another thing I advise, don't become a driver of anything, a pilot or a bus driver. That's going to be one of the first jobs to go. Okay, 
Another thing you can do to profit from this revolution is to buy a house where the robotics clusters are, right? Like if you had bought a house in Silicon Valley 40 years ago, now you are rich. So where are these robotics clusters? So one of them is in Silicon Valley, in California. And another one, the biggest one of them, is in Boston, Massachusetts. So that's, that's, that's how you could make money of it. And so that's all for the presentation, which is a bit technical. And um, I'll take questions after Christine's presentation. Yes, so now I'm calling Christine to the stage. Thank you. Thank you.